This week on Death of the Reader, we finally escaped the clutches of England and crossed the channel to France. We'll have Dr. Keith Rathburn on to talk about the historical contexts of the story, and we'll have a fair little puzzle to sort out with far too many coincidences abound. You're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour on 2SER, and we are Flex and Herds, and it's time for a brand new story. Well, 1866 is hardly new. My goodness, you're clearly still feeling a bit defeated after the floating admiral last week. I'm not defeated. If anything, I've come back stronger than ever. (laughs) But you are absolutely right. Nonetheless, it is a new novel for me, and today we'll be starting with chapters one to seven of the classic French detective novel, The LaRouge Case. Ooh, I'm so excited. Yeah, this is a fun novel. I, I hope you're enjoying it as much as as much as I've enjoyed the whole thing so far with this bite-sized piece you've experienced. But yeah, I'm just excited to get out of England. Um, <laughs> Some um, would say that that itself was a harder challenge than everything we've discussed thus far. I would agree. Honestly, that was the biggest, that was the toughest part. We were like, Man, we've been in England for two whole for two whole weeks now. We got to get out of here. We got to see the world, and trying to find a, a link, especially from from the detection club, that he gave me lots of all this to work with, was was difficult uh, at best. And eventually, we ended up with Emil Gaborio. And I wanna I wanna say right now before we go in, this ain't a this ain't a Falx pass or anything but <laughs> i may not be the best at pronouncing the french words please do not do i, not I don't me. think either of us will be though we would love to hear your corrections and promptly proceed to not ignore them not, not use them accurately yes, that's exactly what's <laughs> going to happen but yeah i mean it's no secret i i think to anyone that detective fiction is kind of globally centered for most people around the uk yes i mean especially as english-speaking readers There's not really much room to maneuver there. Mm -hmm. The golden age of detective fiction as it's known was, you know, the early 20th century in England. Yep, it was in England. And so trying to find something outside of that is is a death sentence, basically. But we did it. We made it. All the way to 1866 to find a novel. And uh, yeah, we're doing the Leverage case. I don't want to say that I'm finding it particularly difficult because (laughs) I, I don't. I mean, I, I'm not, but I also don't want to come in here, you know, guns blazing and be like, pow, 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 it was this, it was this, and just be completely <laughs> wrong. I do want to say, though, I think that the thing that was particularly interesting to me about this novel was seeing where a lot of the, I don't, I don't want to call them tropes, but a lot of the archetypes from yeah. detective fiction originated. This story was originally published uh, in a newspaper, serialized, a fouilleton, apparently is the, the French term for it. Um, and it was, you know, one of the first detective novels. It was designed to be read, you know, one chapter at a time. And, uh, yeah, a lot of the tropes that we kind of see, um, one of the most interesting ones being the conflict with the detective and the police, uh, is to be found in this novel. I think that when we talk about, you know, the whole police versus detective angle, like it it doesn't really feel justified. It just kind of starts. It's like the first chapter of the novel. They're just like, oh, do we really need Tabaret's help? What is this? And they do because he's the best and he can just make conjecture out of nothing. And it's 100% correct. Wait, hold on. You're just just admitting that? You're just admitting his conjectures are correct? You know what? I can confirm not deny anything, but as far as you know, 100% correct. I see. Sir, um, that's one of the... I don't know. I guess criticisms of the novel, there's a lot of weird coincidences and stuff just kind of happens. I I do find it interesting looking at those coincidences and wondering if maybe that was like the only way to kind of keep an audience reading, knowing that something exciting was going to happen each week. Like those coincidences, whilst they definitely are a bit jarring at times, they also do mean that things are constantly moving forwards. Yes. Yes, And I think that in the serialized format that this story supposedly came out in, that would have been the audience like, oh, I wonder what conjecture Tabaret is going to make this week. What strange new character is going to appear at the start of next chapter? Yeah. Which is, I mean, that's something that happens. It's early clickbait. (laughs) It's great. (laughs) Um, Yeah, I really enjoy that aspect of of the writing. I think that it's fun that he has, you know, Emile has this challenge to overcome. How do I keep people gripped? How do I keep them interested? How could I not just exposit every other chapter? And that's what keeps you keeps you reading, keeps you coming back to check not just the news, but the news on crime, one indeed, might say. Indeed, indeed. I think the other thing that I found really fun was uh, Lecoq, or however it is you pronounce his name. Lecoq. He is, he is the detective that <laughs> I think most people would know yeah. from this author, but he 
barely happens in this story. Yeah, he's just he's just there to set up Tabaret and then wring his hands in amazement at Tabaret's or Tabaret Claire as he is he's apparently known as well. It's so brilliant because he reads just like an absolute hype man, and I love it. So good. He's just crazy for this this old man and being like, what is he going to say next? The thing is, is when you picture him as the inspiration for Sherlock Holmes hmm. and then try and picture a modern variation of Sherlock Holmes, but as a hype man, like, well, <laughs> one one fun thing, uh, Colonel Arthur Doyle, she, he, she wrote about uh, Monsieur Lecoq and called him, uh, I believe, a, a bumbling fool, with, <laughs> <laughs> which is, I mean, not incorrect. <laughs> so you're saying that he was more of a Watson inspiration because I was under the impression Maybe. that he was more of a Sherlock inspiration. I mean, I think he is definitely a Sherlock inspiration, like the disguises um, and the kind of way, the creative way that you approach approach crime. I think that that's kind of where Sherlock uh, got his inspiration from, right? When we look at the, particularly the opening scenes with the police department and Tabaret wandering around the house, mm. there isn't really anyone in that scene aside from, like, I guess, the extras that feels, uh, like, incompetent. Like, everyone's sure. noticing clues and making conjectures. Sure, yeah. It's not just the detective walking and going, walking around and going, ah, oh, and this happened, and ah, oh, and this happened. Like, well, he does, but he's not he the only eventually. one in the scene. Yes, yes, yes. There's a bit more of a character dynamic there, which I think yeah. is... I don't want to say lost in more modern novels, but definitely less prevalent yeah. in the ones I've read. There's kind of a, a background ensemble that's going on. And you're right. In Certainly in more modern novels, there's this idea of having to, to push the, the main character. And like, this is the character you identify with and, and have tears with and break bread with and, and see what they're doing. But yeah, this novel feels, in a strange way, it, it feels humbler, but also feels more natural. It feels like a lot of the stuff that's happening, um, a lot of the way the, the cops, are, the, the police approach the crime the gendarmes um it feels like they're real real people or real characters i suppose not not quite real people but but close to it close enough i think that the way that this novel does it certainly feels i guess a bit more like a play in the way that it runs out yeah i would, I would it's more characters that. coming in and out of the scene and having their moment on stage rather than just kind of following the puzzle down a line. There's also a lot more uh, visual descriptions of the characters, the way that they throw themselves around, like grabbing their faces with their hands and, and covering themselves and turning the face away. Like I could picture this being put on stage in a theater and I would love to see that. One of my favorite, I, I don't want to say tropes, but elements of the story is, is the messages. There are a number of points throughout the story where the characters say, they say, I've made this discovery. I've, <laughs> I've figured this out. I need to talk to this character. So rather than having a scene with that character, I'm going to send a messenger. Hey, you kid, come over here. I got a parcel for you. The, the messages are never important characters. They're just nameless just NPCs that, that are being sent off. They're just nameless like actors, you know, part of the ensemble. Um, and they're just being sent off. Um, there's one part in particular that I, that I remember. We are not here to talk, but to discover the guilty, said he to the corporal. That the information be at once conveyed to the justice of the peace and the mayor, and send this letter without delay to the Palais de Justice. Shall I carry the letter? Asked the corporal of gendarmes. No, send one of your men. You will be useful to me here in keeping these people in order. Yeah, I think that maybe when we get to solving the mystery, which obviously we will in the third part of the show today, but when we get to solving the mystery, I think it's a lot more obvious which characters have been named and which ones haven't, because yeah. there's a lot of characters that are given, you know, uh, improper nouns, and there's a lot of characters that are just like the messenger, the yep. concierge, the corporal, the locksmith. Yeah, but the when we earrings. when we definitely get the names, important. we know they're someone, yeah, right? We know they're important, and I think that that's definitely something that's carried on for the the later history of murder mystery. Yep. But you can definitely see it at play in a very distinct, clear manner here. Sure, yeah. But now, Herds, it's time for our regular little guest spot. This week is Dr. Keith Rathburn, an expert on French history who maybe can teach us a thing or two about the historical context of this novel and maybe how to pronounce things correctly. This is Death of the Reader. You're listening to Death of the Reader on 2SER, where your hosts Flex and Herds, and today we have a very special guest, Keith Rathburn, world-class historian and specialist on all things French. Tell me, Keith, how are you going today? Good. Thanks for having me on, guys. It's <laughs> wonderful having you here. So, our novel, The Le Rouge Case, was written and also takes place in the period just before the founding of the Third Republic in France. I wanted to ask about the kind of political climate at the time in the wake of the revolution uh, the French is so well known for. Well, the the 
late 18th and, and really the mid 19th century in France are the ages of revolution. There's a whole series of revolutions starting with the French Revolution that we all know and love and, and terminating, I, I guess you might want to say, in the revolutions of 1848, mm -hmm. which bring in the Second Republic. And then in uh, 1851, you have Louis Napoleon, Napoleon III, who uh, seizes power uh, through a coup. And it's in this Second Empire that the second Napoleonic empire rather that this book is taking place. So this book takes place in this moment of, of revolutionary um, uh, disquiet, but then immediately afterwards, this kind of settling down this emergence of this strong empire and, and people really associated the Napoleonic empires, both the, the first Napoleonic empire, but especially the, the second Napoleonic empire, at least at first with, with prosperity and, and, and generally with, with uh, real progressive change in some ways, which seems a little strange given that they're empires. But um, I think it, it dovetails into the politics of this book that we were talking about a little bit before the interview started. A lot of the humor in the novel is at the expense of the, of the French aristocracy, and I'd say there's a lot of you know, anti-aristocratic undertones to this novel. Um, I'm curious about the position of the aristocracy following the turmoil of the revolution and the, the Second Republic. What was their situation like in, uh, in the, I guess, the mid-1800s? So I think the thing that you need to know about the French aristocracy is that throughout the 19th century, it's really in, in flux. Mm. So before the French Revolution, there's three orders within France. There's the first order, which are the clergy. There's the second order, which are the nobility. And then there's the third order, the third estate, which is everybody else. Mm. And that's 97% of all the people in France. And France in this period before the French Revolution is a world of privilege. So every different order um, has its own rights and privileges. So for example, if you were a member of the Third Estate and you were in the, in the guild that made uh, barrels, nobody else was allowed to make barrels. Well, the nobles have some of the most um, beneficial privileges, you might think of them, within the old regime or the ancien regime. They don't pay any tax. All the peasants have to uh, pay them certain duties, uh, uh, specifically on salt, specifically on the milling of grain, and they also have to give them over a, a portion of their um, uh, of their agricultural uh, production, right? So these nobles are, um, many of them, in the eyes of the peasantry at least, or in the eyes of most ordinary French people, mm. which is to say uh, a an expropriating class. And then the French Revolution changes all that. All these seigneurial privileges are thrown by the wayside. And in the 19th century, the French noble class, the aristocracy is really trying to, to, to figure out where they fit within the new French uh, social mm. system. They still exist. They're still by far the richest um, group of people. They own more land than everybody else, but they're facing challenges because of a rising middle class, mm. specifically a merchant middle class based out of cities like Bordeaux, um, and also continual pressure um, from the political classes. And so throughout the 19th century, you see a gradual progressive move from the, the Bourbon Restoration, which is the most ultra-royalist, most pro-aristocratic group, and the aristocrats support this group, through to the, the, July, um, the July monarchy, which is more of a liberal uh, monarchy, but still a constitutional monarchy, and then into that second republic, and then the second empire. And in the second empire, one of the things Napoleon III does is reinstitute universal suffrage, right? He says, look, I'm the emperor. Everybody loves me. I'm, I'm, I'm winning every plebiscite. Um, so that's why I can reintroduce <laughs> universal suffrage. And, and at this time, the nobility are really um, there. This is one of their weakest moments as a social class within the French, within the French system, within the French political and social system. Yeah, one of our main characters in the book is actually going through a bit of turmoil because he's discovered that his, you know, noble lineage isn't actually what he thought it was, and there's another character who's actually got the right to his lineage and all of those things. Do you think that those kind of uh, those kind of character explanations embody the class struggles that you see in that period where people aren't really sure where they belong in that social hierarchy? I, I think that that's uh, right on, and I, I think that. Um, what's important to know about the, the seigneurial system and, and the system of, of nobility at that time is it's, is it's hereditary. So Napoleon uh, III reinstitutes hereditary nobility after the, the second, our second Republic. But 
uh, it's not necessarily assigned to any specific privileges or, or lands or monies. So for a lot of aristocrats who have maybe lost some of the previous uh, financial capital that they might have had, the special uh, political privileges, the name is what they have left. Right. So it's very important to them to, to retain this to retain this name in some ways. But at the same time, uh, there's the sense that nobles re- still have certain kinds of social and cultural privileges. If you went into any small town in France at the time, uh, the such and such de whatever, de being of. So that's how you know to know the French noble name. If somebody has like Pierre de whatever, it means that they're Pierre of this place. That's a, a note of nobility. I think one of the things that fascinates me about what you say there is the idea that you know, everyone knew the famous, you know, dear people, of, in our case, the de Comerin family in this town. And there was a moment earlier in the book that we were talking about that kind of seemed a little bit absurd because it's like, oh, yeah, of course, everyone knows everyone and everyone's connected to everyone. Would the, you know, locales in France at this time have been that small that people would know everyone? I mean, it depends on the locale. Um, Paris was quite a large city at the time, over a million people. So Paris wouldn't have had this. But most French people, um, until the middle of the of the 20th century even, most French people lived in rural communes, lived in rural towns, oftentimes of fewer than 2,000 people. So they really did know everyone. Uh, and, you know, for our listeners here, it might feel a little bit like knowing everybody in your little suburb. If your town had one of these nobles, uh, Everybody would know this person. They'd live in one of the biggest houses, if not the biggest house in town. Uh, they would be among the most well-established families, even if they don't necessarily have very much money by this time, because by the mid-19th century, many rural nobles are are um, increasingly impoverished. Maybe not the poorest people in town, but not as rich as they used to be. But they had this kind of social prestige of being a noble. Uh, so everybody would know them. People would probably be a little jealous of them. They might have uh, a kind of long sense of 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 um, wo- that they'd been wounded by the nobility, that their grandfathers had had to pay these onerous taxes and tithes to the nobility. So they probably didn't like them. And then throughout the 19th century, the no- nobles were the people who dominated politics because you had to mm. be until the Second Republic, you had to be within the top 1% of France to even be allowed to vote in the constitutional monarchy. So um, nobles weren't necessarily the most well-loved, although oftentimes liked in spite of all of this. Mm. Keith, I had a a personal question. I wanted to know, uh, in your own words, please explain what a a feuilleton is. A feuilleton Feuilleton. is is a, uh, just a kind of a a weekly paper, uh, more or less, um, that would come out in, 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 this kind of a, a books like the one we're talking about here would come out in a serial form, mm-hmm. either um, often once a month, sometimes once a week. I don't know in, in the specific case of this book, um, but it, it, rather than coming out all at once, because it was actually quite difficult for people to, to even still to buy books. They were expensive. Um, newspapers served a kind of more useful function. You could buy a newspaper. You could... Um, you know, keep up with all of the events of the day. You could trade it. You could read it in a cafe. Um, mm-hmm. Oftentimes, if you were illiterate and in the middle of the 19th century, um, more French men and women were literate than were not. But not mm-hmm. everybody was literate. Um, you would go to a cafe and people would be reading these articles out loud. So you can imagine um, sitting around with some of your friends after work or, um, you know, maybe with uh, other colleagues from around your particular little rural village, reading these feuilletons um, mm-hmm. and waiting for the next edition to come out so the story would progress. And that might take a year. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for joining us, Keith. It's been a pleasure having you on the show. Thanks for having me. It's this is Death of the Reader. We're discussing the LaRouge case, and we'll be back in just a second. You're listening to Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour on 2SER. Thank you to Paul Meter for these lovely tunes that guide us towards victory each and every week. 
We are discussing the LaRouge case, chapters one to seven. I have read just those chapters, but Herds here has read everything. It's true. I've read all 20-ish chapters. We got a long way to go, but I reckon, Herds, I reckon I have this solved. I don't think you do. You are overconfident <laughs> to a T, to a fault, sir. I'm going to prove you wrong, and I got the scores to prove it. I got the evidence. Really? Really? Yes. All right, I'm looking forward to it. I I'm will say right to you off tell the bat, me what you got. My, my suspected culprit is Noel, mm. or Noel, what? however it is you pronounce it. But he's just a good boy. He lives with his with his mother, who isn't actually his mother, maybe. I just and he just wants to take care of her. That's all he wants. In the, the thing world. is, I feel like there were there are three passages that if, if I played them in quick succession right now, it would just be the damning evidence to put this man to court. What? Like, there's we we open up in chapter one. Let's let's grab let's grab our exes. Gonna, let's, let's do go it. Let's go over. Let's go over the evidence. The widow continued. The old fellow. Knew the person who knocked. Her haste opened the door gives rise to this conjecture. What follows proves it. The assassin then gained admission without difficulty. He is a young man, a little above the middle height, elegantly dressed. He wore on that evening a high hat. He carried an umbrella and smoked a Trebuchet cigar in a holder. All right, so we have a young cigar-smoking man. Apparently. All right. Apparently. Cool. I don't know any of cigar-smoking men in this novel. <laughs> I, I can't even think of one. All right. Let's go to Where's our second piece of damning evidence. Oh, my goodness. Yes, there is a child, and here is his history. The widow Le Rouge, when a young woman, is in the service of a great lady immensely rich. Her husband, a sailor, probably had departed on a long voyage. The lady had a lover, found herself... Enchanté. She confided in the widow Le Rouge and with her assistance accomplished a clandestine accouchement. And let's just quickly throw in that third excerpt, nice short one. She was, continued Noel, the slave of Madame Gertie, devoted to her in every way. She would have sacrificed herself for her at a sign from her hand. Three, three strikes, you're still in. Three strikes, all right. Now listen, I know that those three on their own could be simply construed as a handful of misdirection. I would agree. But but for one simple little detail here. Mm-hmm. Throw it at and me. that is the way that Noel is described when he first enters the scene. Throw it at me, Flex. Can we can we just talk about like how suspicious this man is described? He's just a young man. It is absolutely ludicrous. He's just hanging out in his own home. Alright. Can we just talk about what let, let let's just talk about. You've just killed someone for the first time, Herds. What? I know you've experienced this many times, all right? I mean, yes. We're not supposed to say that on air, but okay. (laughs) You have just killed someone for the first time. Your neighbor, who you know is a detective, has showed up at your house. You don't know that. You don't know that he's a detective. No, they they know he's a detective. They just don't know that he's working this case. I suppose so. All right. And... This was the accident that his mother had just passed out for. You know, he has just seen his mother, his carer, suffer at the hands of what were probably his actions. He's just killed someone for the first time. He is, as Tabare describes, most likely the child of this incident. And he is a young 30-something man who would fit the description and height of what was said in the earlier chapter. As a neighbor of someone who is an amateur detective... You've probably discussed their cases. You probably know what they get up to in their spare time. Flex, do you know any amateur detectives? I do. His name is his name is Flex. That doesn't count. You're right. You can't you can't (laughs) name yourself as your friend detective that you know next door. I'm just saying you have no experience in this regard. You don't even know. Well, maybe there's a second guy named Flex who lives just around the corner from me, and I've just never introduced you because I'm concerned you'll kill him next. I don't believe that there will be next. I don't believe that there will be more than one person named Flex in this world. Okay, I just don't think it's possible. Uh, Name your kid Flex. Prove me wrong. (laughs) (laughs) Send that to us on Instagram, Facebook, or Twitter at Flex and (laughs) Hurts. <laughs> Hashtag christening flex. Let's go. All right. Now listen, I've laid it out. You are not turning me away from this theory. I think I think that as one of the first founding detective stories in a serialized story where we were getting this piece by piece, week by week, I think that that is a fair distribution of the culprit's motive sure. and identity. Sure, that's fine. Uh, wait, what's his motive exactly? Lay it out for me. Lay it out for me. What do you think his motive is? I believe it's something to do with the family connection. I'm still, okay. this is definitely where I'm shakier. Okay. I, I do believe that, uh, perhaps something to do with, uh, the relationship, maybe the fact that, uh, 
the Widow LaRouge was in fact so rich and, you know, Jody and Noel are in different circumstances. Maybe there's a schism there that happened over the years. Mm, maybe. Uh, it's definitely something that I'll have to look at as we go into the later well, chapters. I would pose a slightly different theory. Oh, would you now? I'm calling it the Jody Shaw theory because oh, it's, no. it's Jody Shaw, <laughs> but it's the older Jody. <laughs> It's the lovely old lady who is apparently dying of a, a terrible sickness that has just uh -huh, come uh -huh. over her from, from hearing bad news. I see, I see. But I think she hired an assassin. Uh huh. Was the assassin just Noel? No, of course not, because <laughs> that, would, that would render that a moot point. Was the assassin maybe going to be Noel until maybe I he's said an it? Accomplice. No, no, no. Maybe he's an accomplice. Maybe, she, maybe he knows what his, oh. his, his mother has done. But I think there's an, another character in the novel that that fits the uh, the purview of, of a character who who knows how to sword fight, who you know has ties to, to money and influence. Mm, mm. Um, they've been introduced a little a little bit later in the novel, and that's that's Albert. Okay, it was, it was part of this whole uh, mix up. Apparently, these kids have been have been have been switched at birth, and Albert is apparently caught up in that. And I would like to to posit that um, uh, through some some circumstance. Uh, Mrs. Jerdy has has hired Albert. Said, you know, I'll I'll turn you. I'll let all this truth out if you don't go and as assassinate um, this this poor old widow Larouge. I'm just saying, I don't think that Noel could could kill an old lady. I think he's just he's just not equipped. I was with you right until that sentence. <laughs> I was I was willing to go down this path and share this journey with you as you should picking between our two culprits until that decided that was going to be your key evidence. That's not my key evidence. It's just the point I decided to end on. Oh, I clear. see. Let's be clear. It's I see because you couldn't actually end on anything useful, is what you're telling me. Look, I got plenty of useful stuff in there. You just gotta, you just gotta, <laughs> you just gotta listen to me. You just gotta listen to me speak. I'm just saying, old lady doesn't want the secrets getting out. Realizes, hey, we got to off this old lady, this other old lady. So it's two old ladies fighting. Is really what's at the core mm, of this mm -hmm. novel. You know, that's why it's all about duality. I see. Um, and and so Albert is the like the, the the pair to to Noel in that he is being is being played by this old lady. I see. So you think that this is two buddy cop relationships yes. going against each other. In being fact, three buddy inversely. cop relationships. Yes. So we have this the Widow the LaRouge cop. and Albert Look, going against Noel and Madame Jody if there's and one then thing, Lecoq and Tabaret. If there's one thing that I've learned from reading this novel is it's all about relationships. That's the most important thing of this entire novel. You gotta watch out. You gotta watch out for those relationships because that's when they get you. There are apparently some other characters who've been, who've been visiting... Uh, the Widow Luge. Do you suspect any of those? Do you think they're accomplices? The man with the earrings in particular might be might be an interesting one. I'm, Jeff Roll ran after him. I'm definitely trying to think like how effectively each of these characters is going to be used. Because obviously they're all introduced and they're all given some specific character descriptions. Earrings and the sunburn and all that sort of thing. Yeah, so I feel as though they're going to end up being important. But considering that we are in the early part of the story and that our assertion when we declare what chapters we're going to read is that the early part of the story should contain the necessary clues to solve the puzzle, I do believe that the necessary clues to solve the puzzle exist within chapters 1 to 3 and are refined up to chapter 7. When we talk about being swapped at birth, when we talk about you know, the connection and finances and history of the two women and Albert and Noel, you know, that, that's all of the details that'll let us figure out the why. I'm still a little torn on what specifically those are, but mm. I do think that we have what we need. Fair enough. Fair enough. Well, I suppose we'll, we'll have to see what happens then. I'm just saying, old ladies, they make better better murderers in general because they got more they got more fighting them they got more more experience they know how to kill a man all right all right i'm looking forward to that thank you for joining us this week on death of the reader with the larouge case as always you can catch us online at flex and herds now just hold on a second here herds i've got <clears throat> i got something i need just let me go grab something tell us tell us what we're reading next week uh we're reading up to the end of chapter 14 so Get your, get your books ready, get your detective notebooks, and, and read along. We'll see you then. In the meantime, I've brought in a broken foil into the are studio. You, are you kidding me? No, no. So what we're going to do between this week and next week is we're going to try to recreate the crime in the room. Okay. All right? Sounds good. So I'm going to be Albert. Uh-huh. You're going to be the Widow LaRouge. Okay. And if you're not on the show next week, that means I've killed you, and thus you were right. If Let's you're alive it. next week, Let's do it. it means I was right. It's a small sacrifice, but one I am willing to make. Let's go! <laughs>